All right. And then, um, like I said, uh, we've got a couple of these pretty, uh, I don't want to say laid back because I think the conversations have been really uh, powerful and fruitful and they've really ranged from all over. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we're on a Zoom call. Many of us know one another. We'll go around and introduce uh, each other and uh, where you where you're working, maybe how long you've been there, and uh, either uh, an opportunity you're seeing in your industry, in your region, in your organization, or a challenge. And either one of them doesn't matter. If you want to mention both, go ahead. This thing keeps me up at night. Uh, this thing also keeps me up at night because I'm really excited about it. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to start with you, Gloria. Why don't you introduce yourself, where you're from, how many years you've been there, and a, a kind of a challenge or opportunity you're excited about. Okay, so I'm Gloria Palmer. I'm the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. We have an office in Dorset, Vermont, but we offer adult education programs in the form of lectures and workshops um, throughout Manchester. I'm looking to spread out a little bit, maybe offer some programs at the Arlington Common. Um, and um, I've been with the organization now probably 19 years. Um, I was assistant to the founding executive director, and then maybe 13 years ago, I was asked to step in as executive director. Um, the challenges <laughs> have been this pandemic and um, having to transition all of our programming to Zoom uh, programs, and it has been successful, uh, but I think a lot of people are, are getting tired of it, and we can't wait to get back to in-person, and our summer season will be starting in May. We have a catalog coming out. Um, and it covers, you know, a, a lecture just about every Tuesday night, um, a variety of workshops, and a good number of them will be in person. We're also trying something new uh, with Burn Burton Academy's help um, doing hybrid programming. We will have an uh, in-person audience uh, with a speaker there, and they, there will be an audience on Zoom as well. And um, we have definitely seen some benefits to the to this whole virtual world because we have people joining us from all over the country, even some as far as you know, Europe and, and uh, the Middle East joining us for our lectures. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to have presenters from um, outside this area who may not travel here and, and can just do it on Zoom. So um, I think that's about it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And, you know, I'm taking notes. Eric and I always kind of connect after this and really try and piece things together. And if I share it with the, the chamber board, you know, I, I liked what you said. Um, I'd love feedback eventually, Gloria, honest feedback about your hybrid model. Um, you know, we've tried some of that with our lunch and learns. Um, I think we went completely digital for our annual meeting. Um, but yeah, I would just love to kind of hear your, your experience eventually when, when you guys get there. Um, and, and really, I like, we had toyed with this too, but I love your thought process around digital has helped you become global. That really yes. your sandbox yeah. isn't the Ma Manchester, your sandbox isn't Southern Vermont, your sandbox isn't even Vermont anymore. That technique, yeah. that as nonprofits, it'd be interesting to kind of, um, kind of poke at the idea of, look, we can kind of, we're borderless, you know, to some degree yeah. in, in the yeah. digital world. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, Jennifer, good afternoon. Hi, um, nice to see you. I am Jennifer Ludi. I'm the development director at Northshire Day School. Um, and we have had a lot of opportunities lately that are very exciting, um, but do present some challenges. Um, I'm sure um, everyone knows the struggles to staff local businesses, um, and a lot of that connects directly to whether or not people have childcare. And our biggest issue is that we have a waiting list of over a hundred students, um, which means that there are employees out there that could be working that can't because we don't have space. Um, and one of the things that we need to work on is our own staffing. Um, and another is finding ways to expand our offerings. And we, we added a classroom um, during the pandemic. We turned our cafeteria space into a classroom and we are struggling to find the resources to make that permanent. There's some things we would have to do 
um, to make that a permanent classroom and finding someone to do the work um, has been difficult and um, finding the staff to keep that permanently um, staffed is our other challenge. But I think a lot of people are facing that right now as well. Yeah. How long have you been there, Jennifer? Um, my first year is up in seven days. So um, I'm you. very yeah. new here. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, welcome. Great Thank to have you. you. Thank you for hopping on. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the conversation, I think, Jennifer, you were at the Young Professional uh, meeting as well. Um, it, it's like gears to a clock, right? We want more people in the workforce because we have these you know, new places coming online. We have places that were kind of shut down from the pandemic that are also now coming online. We're looking for that workforce. Half that workforce has to stay home because of childcare. Wait a minute, in childcare, we also need workers. So yeah, it, it kind of is like you have to get all the gears moving at the same time. And I think that that is staffing, childcare, housing tend to be the three themes that Eric and I've heard in the last uh, couple of round tables. Absolutely. Mary? Hi, um, Mary. my name is Mary McGinnis. Hi, Erica. Hi, um, Mary. <laughs> I just heard about this meeting about 20 minutes ago. I stopped in the office of St. Peter's Church in Bennington and was asked if I had anything to do at noon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure what, why I'm here, what to expect, but um, I've been involved with uh, St. Peter's for about 15 years. Uh, our challenges are as Gloria mentioned, the hybrid situation, we're doing services and it's very challenging as far as sound and people, but you know, the upside is we get people from all over the world attending. So uh, another challenge right now is that we're hiring for a new rector and the housing situation in Bennington is a problem in that regard. Um, we are on Pleasant Street in Bennington, which we consider a great location. Uh, we've tried to do things with the tutorial center. We have toyed around with the idea of providing babysitters for people who want to go there um, and complete their, to complete their degrees. We had a block party some years ago. We really want to interact with our neighborhood. And of course, that's been almost impossible. Um, the last few years, but we did have a successful community coffee project. I think it was 2020, 2021, 2020, where we served hot coffee on the front sidewalk. And that um, attracted a lot of people. That was a good, a good result from COVID. Mary, are you finding that you are both in kind of discussions to bring that back as a congregation? Do you think people are exciting, willing. We've had a little spike here with COVID, but I think by and large, you know, the feeling is it's going to be a pretty good summer to be outside and being at events. What, what, are, you, what are you getting a sense of? Uh, the coffee project, people didn't want to do it this past winter. It was an effort of the Interfaith Council. Maybe I can also represent them here. <laughs> um, so people from different faith communities came, each took a day, and I wasn't getting excited response from people this year about doing it. Um, so it might be something that should be opened up beyond faith communities, just to, you know, to anybody who wants to take a day, serve coffee and hot chocolate for two hours. Yeah, and it'd be interesting, you know, obviously we, we live in the world of volunteers as well. I, you know, I, I, I think one of the things we're all gonna have to keep an eye on and, and I get on this soapbox every time we have a round table with people, but the, the trauma of COVID and the trauma of the pandemic and people are really shifting their lives, right? They're shifting their lives to a more hybrid model now. Some of them are leaving their jobs, you know, the great resignation. Uh, it, it would be interesting to watch the volunteer capacity and are people hopping back into that fray or are they saying, I want to spend my time more wisely with my family that I love that I didn't get to see for two years or you know, it's just, you know, I'm burned out. I'm, I'm tired of serving. I'm tired of uh, doing the food bank. I'm tired of being alone, whatever it happens to be tired over the last two years. And do we see a decrease in volunteers? And I, something, Erica, you know, we need to keep an eye on in terms of people's morale and energy for sure. Natalie. Hi. Hi. 
So I'm, I'm Natalie Basil. I'm the executive director at GBIX, Greater Bennington uh, Interfaith Community Services, which is the umbrella organization for the Bennington Free Clinic yes. for the uninsured and underinsured um, population. Um, we have the kitchen cupboard food distribution program through our organization. We have an emergency needs fund, and we also host and sponsor the Molly Stark Dental Clinic for um, kiddos in the Molly Stark School. Um, I have been in my role one year and one day. <laughs> Yesterday was my work anniversary. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm celebrating this week with you, Jennifer, too. too so a year under our belts. Um, I, I would say opportunities. What I've learned in the year is that there are a lot of really great um, people working to make Bennington a better place. Um, and collaboration seems to be um, something that folks are eager to have and um, open to. And that's been really lovely um, being new in my role. I would say one of the challenges that I'm that I'm facing and, you know, with our work and the programs we work with is um, really helping the community have a depth of understanding about poverty and homelessness and and um, and it's not a quick fix, right? It's not just about getting a job. And I think that there's some misinformation and some myths out there that perpetuate and cause um, a lot of stigma around, um, around poverty, low income, homelessness, um, and really trying to, there's some really great champions that we have in the community. And then we have some really difficult um, populations and communities that really just don't, don't understand. And so really, how do we develop as a community that empathy and that deeper understanding of the cycles of of poverty and um, and homelessness and what and generational trauma and poverty and all of these pieces that really play into what is the fabric of of Bennington in our past and how do we move forward in the future? I do also want to say that um, I I want I have to pop off at twelve thirty because I do have another meeting. But when I saw this come up, I was like, I have been wanting to like come to a chamber event for a year, and I feel like I had to like, even if I couldn't come the whole but time, I felt like it. I at least needed to show up. <laughs> uh, where were you? Um, where were you before this? I was at Bennington College as the dean okay. of students. Okay. Yeah. Great. For um, so I've made my family and I've been in the Bennington area for um, five years now. Yeah. Great. And what a time to be. I mean, you've kind of seen it all. Um, so an and exciting time for Bennington and, and the region. Uh, and then we will finish up with Victoria. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. I, <laughs> um, I feel I'm connected with all of you in some way. So maybe as um, a parent, when our kids were going through school, um, through programming. Gloria, I know you and I have worked on programming together. So my name is Victoria Silsby and I've worked at the Collaborative uh, since January of 09. I don't have enough fingers to count those years, um, but it's more than 10. Um, it is more than a job to me. It is a, a um, a, a, a dedication or it's part of my blood. I'm not really sure all of the above. We focus on uh, preventing substance misuse and building healthy communities. So as I started to say in some way, I think I've reached out to all of you in some capacity and have worked together except maybe marry you, but just so you know, um, uh, there was a large part of my late, late elementary and um, through my, uh, until I got married, uh, that St. Peter's was my uh, church. So it was where my husband and I got married. I was baptized, uh, uh, not baptized, confirmed uh, during the years of Father Costin. Um, so um prevention we're what we're focused on right now is realizing and trying to educate the community that everyone has a role to play in prevention 
So whether you're a business owner, whether you're a child care provider, whether you work with uh, retirees um, or the retirees have a role to play, everyone has a role to play uh, in prevention. Um, and it's and prevention is way more than than um, prevention is no longer telling kids don't do drugs and just say no. Uh, we we know that that doesn't work. So um, I would say that uh, educating the community on that um, is a heavy lift. Uh, but it also creates an opportunity. I never, um, and recently for Bennington County slash area uh, champions were nominated by the collaborative and were recognized by a state entity called Prevention Works Vermont in the role that those four individuals play in supporting prevention. One was Michael Schaefer, a middle school teacher at Dorset. One was the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, Jackie Barella, who used to be a, a business owner in Manchester, but has, is, um, has the esteemed designation of being a founding parent to the collaborative. Um, and last but not least, I'd be amiss if I didn't uh, also include Kelly Pajala, the Londonderry area state representative. So you can see that actually none of those people were really recognized as a parent or, um, and so they all play significant roles in prevention and building healthy communities. The philosophy is, the higher the substance use rate in a community, community could be anything, a school, a place of business, a town, then the unhealthier tendency of that community. That's kind of, that's it in a nutshell. Great. And Matt knows that I could hijack this whole conversation for two hours. Okay, I return the favor often when we hop on a phone call and I, we have a half an hour phone call and two hours later, Victoria and I are still going. And her staff is like, okay, we have to hop off now. We need to go. So, and I, then I, Matt I, and I, I stay on. Right, right. So, uh, I, so if anyone wants a coffee pledge, I'd be happy to coordinate one. Yeah, and that's again, you know, go back to the theme of what Eric and I started. I mean, that is the power of, of this. And, and, you know, I think now in my sixth year, Erica, you're, you've done your four year, right? You're on your fourth year now. That's amazing. Um, we're just really, again, post COVID pandemic, blah, 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 going through all that, going through, you know, a small town chamber to a regional chamber, really just trying to orient back to the basics of connection. Our job is to be that horizontal function to all of your vertical functions. And I say this, I think, in every roundtable, which is your job as nonprofit leaders is to pay the bills, get the members, donors, produce the programming, have the product, the services, marketing. Um, you know, you, you fill it. It's the function of your job as a vertical. Uh, oftentimes, um, well, I shouldn't say oftentimes, but I do think the role of the chamber or the MBA or the Better Bennington Corporation or any other organizing uh, force is a horizontal function to that, which is to say, we are here to get you guys together. Um, and if that's the least that we do, that's where solutions are, I think, built uh, and, and, and coalitions are built uh, and relationships are built. And we all know that, you know, the work gets done through relationships. Um, you know, yes, there's task, yes, there's process, but uh, it's who we know and how we know them and who we could reach out to. So I love Victoria, your thought around, you know, look, Matt and Erica don't need to bring us together once a quarter, once a year, whatever it happens to be. Let's let's have a coffee round table once a month. We'll meet at a place just to, you know, we've often talked about kind of the, the executive directors club. Uh, you know, you all wear a certain type of, you know, armor, I guess. Yeah, then I wouldn't be able to come because I'm not the executive director. 
Well, to, then, sorry, then, you know, <laughs> Gloria is going to have to organize it. But you know, there used that, to be whatever that there. circle is. You know, nonprofit leaders that get, that can come to the table and have a fruitful conversation, not about that one singular job you have, but the fact that you're wearing seven hats all at once. We used to have that in Man in Manchester yeah. area. There used to be like, and I forget what it was called, but like a nonprofit monthly meeting. Gloria, hmm. do you remember? And then it, yeah, and then it yeah, expanded. I, yeah, I remember it, it had some sort of NNL, something like that. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's interesting. We, um, you know, obviously we're, we're we're doing the Women in Leadership Luncheon sold out. So sorry if you haven't gotten your ticket yet. We that one sold out in about two weeks. No surprise there. We have some amazing uh, women and over what Erica said, over seventy five tickets sold or you know people coming. Um, which, you know, we, we always hope our events are successful, but I think we, we definitely felt like there was a, a, a movement and we knew that this was going to go well. So anyways, we've also talked about other ways we can, again, do that connection, do that highlighting that we think our job as a chamber is to bring recognition and high, highlighting certain minorities, if necessary, or certain people or organizations or industries that are dynamic, especially if they aren't currently recognized. Um, and I think there's room, and I haven't told Erica this, but I think there's room in the future for um, some version of a nonprofit luncheon where we recognize the services that you guys are all doing. Because here's, here's the honest part, in our surveys every single year that we send out to all of you and our members, there's this tug of war between the Chamber of Commerce being business focused, which it should be, it's in its title and in its mission. However, so many nonprofits both make up our membership, make up the kind of fabric of our communities and do a lot of the services that businesses, you know, in other parts of the world are doing. Um, so we can't neglect that large nonprofit sector in our members. And so I think there's something in the future where we, you know, at the very least, get a monthly meeting or a quarterly meeting and bring that back, or at the most, have a celebratory lunch or dinner or gala where we're celebrating uh, nonprofits and services. So if Matt, that's something has that- there, Has there been a, a study of the, and I'll just be really broad, the impact and whatever impact it is, whether it's through services, whether it's financial, whether it's quality of life, has there been a study that shows the impact of nonprofits in this area? Because I'd, I'd go so far as to say, like, if we just closed up shop for, you know, three weeks, yep. it would be really scary. The result and the fallout would be really scary. Yeah, we we Eric and I have talked about that too. Here, I so let me go up a level. So here's what I was going to say next, and then you kind of beat me to the punch, Victoria. When when we do look at nonprofits in Vermont, Vermont has the most nonprofits per capita. It has a nonprofit for every hundred and sixty person in Vermont. If we have three hundred and sixty-five thousand people, there is one nonprofit for every hundred and sixty. 60th person. It is double the number of charities per capita than the national average. And look, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, uh, Vermont is a rural state, so it's a, considered a poverty state. It requires a lot of services. Um, you know, I, I, personally, I think, you know, this used to be what the church did a lot of. The church did the food bank, the church did the clothing, you know, the church did the homeless coalition. Well, you know, we've just moved to a more secular society where nonprofits are. We need that to to kind of run uh, run those. But yeah, and then I think there is, and let me just, Victoria, I've, I've run across it before. I think it's more of a national study of impact, but it'd be interesting to do just a little bit of research. I'm sure there's something around um, um, nonprofits in Vermont and their their collective. Uh, uh, GDP or collective, uh, you know, fundraising, collective, you know, and then finding a way to measure impact. But, uh, you know, that, I think that's a quick, easy Google search on like nonprofit indicators or nonprofit navigator um, and going from there. 
Uh, but let me just, I'll put a note there. I, I, I would be fascinated too. But my, my, my question to all of the, the rest of us on here, yes, with how important nonprofits are to Vermont, how important they are to communities, what, what do you view as the future of nonprofits? So, so kind of like take a marker in time, which let's call COVID pandemic. You know, it's kind of like 9-11. There's kind of pre-9-11 and there's post-9-11. Those two worlds are vastly different. I think we're probably at a point now, 20 years later, pandemic happened. We've got a pre-COVID pandemic world in Vermont and we have a post-pandemic world in Vermont. Where do you, I mean, as you kind of look at your own organizations or as the industry as a whole, where do you see the value? Where do you, do you think you're going to survive? I mean, you know, there's some argument that some chambers will have to close you know, sooner than later, just because they're, they're limping along because nobody wants to pay membership and, you know, it's, it's a new world. So where, where are people at? Well, I can say that, um, I think that we've recognized that there are a lot of organizations like ours, educational organizations that are doing just that on virtual learning. And so I think people have so many more options of where they can go to attend a lecture or program online. And so we're feeling like, okay, you know, um, maybe we need to step up our game. And um, I know this year we are gonna take on a strategic planning process and try to, try to figure out what is the future of Green Mountain Academy? What's, what is that gonna look like? That's, that's great. Um... Thanks, Glory. I, I mean, look, strategic planning is my background, so I'm going to be way biased on this, but every, you know, that's a starting point. I mean, if you don't even have a renewed vision, you know, so, you know, even for us as a chamber, we got to 2020, our vision was to become a regional chamber. And now I keep poking my board to say, well, <laughs> okay, name changed, the logo changed. What, what's the next vision for you? What, what are you all as directors who are representing the industries? What do you think the next 10 years for, for the chamber is? I think that that's great. And I would encourage everybody on this call to explore some version of a visioning exercise and a strategic plan. I mean, strategic plan can be kind of the end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. But even before then, it's like, look, we got to get a retreat going because we really are, in my mind, you know, yes, we have some spikes in COVID, but even 2021, people were just like white knuckling, let's just hunker down, maybe put some savings away. But that won't be sustainable. You won't be able to do that for the next five years. So we need to kind of get, we need to rally our boards or rally our nonprofits or rally our organizations and say, okay, get your breath, take your breath. And now where are you going in the next 10 years? Yeah. So yeah, great, great work, Gloria. I, would, I, would, I was going to say one more thing is that um, we do have a, a number of board members who are going off who have been with us for some time. And right now we're bringing on new board members with the idea that um, some of these some of these new members are, I think, are going to shake things up um, <laughs> and <laughs> for, the, for good or bad. <laughs> um, but I think I think it'll be a good it'll be a good thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm seeing, I don't know if you're seeing, and, and as an educator, you probably think like I do, where you start to build a workshop or you build kind of the four things in my mind, when we talk about renewal of nonprofits, you got at least two of them there, which is like a plan slash vision and new people. Um, and if you did those two, I mean, there's probably more that you could add to that, um, that kind of plan or whatever, but um yeah, we did a couple, we had a couple new board members uh, join us. Um, who else has had in the last year new board members? And would let's say new board members first and then younger board members second. Who had, who's had new board members? We Just had, in the last year? Year or two, since kind of that COVID era. Yeah. yeah. I think that... I, so much of the collaborative's work is, um, goes beyond strategic planning. So we're really fortunate. Our, our executive director, Marianne Morris, um, is pretty much from the get-go, really grounded in strategic planning. I mean, we've, we've even got a communication strategic plan. Um, so, and 
and strategic planning is like, yeah, I don't think a nonprofit can, or a, a large active nonprofit can really successfully run without a strategic plan. It would be like having a business with no, with no plan, right? You can't really have a business if you don't oh, have a plan. Oh you, oh, you can, but uh, I don't recommend it. Right. So, but so much of um, our, our work is grounded in balancing that strategic plan, but incorporating and building sustainability in order, because, well, A, some of our grant funders want to know what we're, how, how we're addressing sustainability, but, but really we have, I don't know if it's part of our success is being able to say, now this is sustained, right? It, we might not be doing it and that's fine, but someone else might be doing it, but that, but that is living on somehow. Um, and so like for instance, um, National Prescription Drug Take Back, Bennington County in part, you know, between a couple of partners, the collaborative and law enforcement primarily was the first county in Vermont to have a take back system. It was an unprecedented, unthought of concept. And now the state modeled the program, statewide program after what we implemented in Little Bennington County. Um, we do our part to maintain what Bennington County has, but we don't lead it statewide. We don't, but that the rec, it wasn't even public recognition, but looking at the state looked at what Bennington was able to pull off the county because it was a county effort and they modeled a three pronged take back approach. And, and that's sustainable. And, that, and that's how we can keep doing what we do is, yeah. is building sustainability into our visioning. Yeah, and I, I wanna f first commend you and, and I wouldn't, I don't think I know uh, from a business perspective, I would say a majority of businesses don't have a plan. They don't have a vision that they don't have a vision one, but that that's even one thing. They they rarely start a business in Vermont with um, a business plan. And I think now, um, if you go through certain programs, they're going to require you to do that. But again, business doesn't have to go through the SBDC or the SBA, which would require you to do some plans. Um, so you'd be surprised how many people are just shooting from the hip every single day. And they don't ever measure how many ice creams or hot dogs or coffees they have to sell. They're just kind of figure it works out. And, and that's the other thing. The state of Vermont a few years ago passed us, I think it's built into a statute that nonprofits have to use results-based accountability. Great. Great. Well, yeah. how many, how many nonprofits in Bennington County use RBA to measure their, what they're doing? Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, I just want to say, Victoria, I commend you. And I think, uh, and the, and the collaborative team, I mean, I don't think a lot of non, I know having offered those services, not a lot of nonprofits have a strategic plan. I think some are coming more to the table, um, to have that conversation and really realizing, you know, one of my questions, I think for everybody, um, <laughs> we, uh, we're doing some, uh, rebuilding of the chamber, uh, and uh, my facilities team have kind of called it, you know, deferred maintenance. Well, it's been deferred since 1978. So what does that put us at? You know, 50 or 60 years now, some of the stuff that we're working on. And I just wonder, I kind of put that, that, that terminology across nonprofits too. What have we deferred maintenance on? One, for two years, right? Because we all had to like, just hold down, hold the fort down, try and get through COVID. But I would argue, and we have some of the most, by the way, we have some of the most progressive nonprofits on this call right now. So I am speaking to the choir. I know I am. Um, there are a lot more nonprofits I wish were on this call that were listening to all of you saying, wait a minute, we need 
<laughs> we need to have young board members. We need to have a strategic plan. Um, but how many of us have deferred maintenance? And some of those nonprofits are, are severely deferred maintenance, not on their building, but on their board, on their governance, on their policies, on their sustainability. Um, they had to just like, we're just going to keep going. Uh, and that, that's kind of what prompted my question to all of you about you know, where do you see nonprofit? I mean, do you see that right now Vermont has the number one nonprofit per capita in the next 10 years? Does that continue? Does that not? Um, so, you know, what was interesting a couple months ago, I helped one of my coworkers. <laughs> create a strategic plan. Uh, my coworker runs an advisory gr group. Um, and, and I facilitated the discussion uh, in order for the advisory group to build a strategic plan. Um, and, and we had a, a person, uh, it was a virtual strategic planning session, which was weird anyway, but we made it work. Um, and this person is, uh, I'll just say in education. And they said something really fascinating that we really took away, my coworker and I really took away and, and brought back to our coworkers. Um, I think we can all think of a moment where we recognize duplication of services efforts. And, and sometimes I thought it was just a, a Manchester thing or a Northshire thing. But then there was this person who works in Bennington who said, you know, I can think of like five organizations all doing kind of the same stuff mm -hmm. or there's 10 of us that are all doing kind of the same stuff and and this po person's point of view was when we have an opportunity to apply for funding or to use funding to do something why is there a tendency for us to okay we have this money let's go out and and do this instead of saying wait a minute XYZ nonprofit down the road is already doing this. Let's just give them the money to do it. There seems to be this, from this person's perspective, well, wait, we have the money, so we need to do it. Yeah, well, and, and, and let's be real about it. And Gloria and, and others, I'd love to hear. So if you went to your board and said, we have the opportunity for $50,000 in, in a stream of thing that we can do, we, we know we can do it. Uh, there's also this other group down here. Why don't we give that 50,000 uh, to them? So, and I don't knock that, Victor. It's the, it's the number one thing we hear. Uh, and I think it is all around ego, but, I, but even ego in a healthy space. Like, you know, we've obviously talked with the whole kind of Manchester Chamber, Bennington Chamber. We talked about MBA. We've talked about the Better Bennington Corp. I mean, they're all kind of these alphabet soups. And yet, you know, some of my challenge when we get down to the nitty gritty is like, so which one of you wants to go before your board and talk about uh, dissolving for the other, you know, you know, for the good, I mean, if we consolidate all our business efforts into one big group, is John Burnham going to do that? Or is uh, Jenny Dewar going to do, you know, we're not, but, but I, I hear you. And I don't know, I think you're right. There are duplication, obviously would be better use of money, but also a better use of if we could consolidate all into one office manager, one printer, one labeling thing to go, you know, like it was all one, we would also have efficiency of scale too. Um, but I just, I struggled to, I mean, it's kind of, we, we, we get on this conversation then we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And then we're not actually doing the, the work that our nonprofits are supposed to be doing. Cause we say, we have a conversation about all the duplication of efforts. And I'm like, well, if you've got a solution for it, we're all ears, but um, I think yeah. That's no, I I've been I grew up in Shaftesbury, and I and I've came back to Manchester in I I don't know a hundred years ago. I didn't. I don't think that I really truly meant give the fifty thousand dollars to the neighboring nonprofit so that they could do it. 
but I think looking at everyone on this call and and Natalie who who's no longer on the call, I would like I would like to explore when there is an opportunity of fifty thousand dollars more partnership yeah. in using that fifty thousand yep. dollars. I'd like to add, I think when you have the opportunity for a grant like that, it's great to get that collaboration going during the application process so that you can you can work together, but it also looks really good on your application that it's not for one thing, it's for a group that's working together. And I think that that makes a big difference. We ran up against something like this um, last, what are we at, spring? Last uh, fall, we were trying to get a drop in shelter for the homeless. And we talked about, we were so frustrated because we needed an overseeing agency to, um, for insurance. So we talked about becoming another, yet another nonprofit and then decided that really what we needed to do was to support the homeless coalition. So. Yeah. 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 We yeah, had, well. we had, um, Around December, I had I the collaborative had about thirty thousand uh, I don't know thirty or forty thousand dollars for subgrantees, and we kind of shoulder tapped about I don't know nine nine organizations. They could apply for up to fifteen thousand dollars. I had. I, I, I feel like I had to strong arm two applicants. And I had reached out to nine or 11 people and said, hey, like, it's basically yours. Just like put your name on a piece of paper and tell me like in three sentences what you're gonna do with $15,000 and I'll work with you yeah. so that it, I'll strengthen the application. I just need to know your name and what you're gonna do with the money. What do you what do you attribute that to, Victoria? I honestly, for this for this particular scenario, it was um, I. I mean, it did kind of keep me up at night. I was like, "What the heck? Like, here's fifteen thousand dollars, and I'm going to help you do everything." Um, it was we don't have anything to do with prevention. Hmm. So a library, there was one, one, two, three libraries. We don't do prevention. Um, there were two schools. We don't do prevention. Wait, what? Schools don't do prevention? No. Yeah, like that doesn't know no, we don't do prevention. Uh, recovery? No, we don't do prevention. Um, a community center? No, we don't do prevention. Interesting. So, so here's kind of a theme that I kind of hear. Um, just wait a minute. Here's yeah, go like ahead. I'm getting ready early fall to roll out another round of a grants. Okay. <laughs> so put it on your calendar. Well, and, and that's a good segue to what I was about to say. Here's the theme I, I kind of hear, and I, you know, I, I'm beating a, a, a drum here, but it is this call. It is like, imagine, so one of, the, one of the things I often talk about and train on in organizations is you've got three things going on in an, any organization. It could be a nonprofit, for-profit. It's your task, what you have to get done. You know, so whether that's prevention measures, whether that's selling books or coffees, the process, how you want to do that. So, it, you know, Gmall is going to do it a little bit differently than Udemy and Udemy is going to do it a little bit different than Khan University and like whatever, that's your process, that's your IP. And then the final one, and really the thing that makes it most dynamic is relationships. So in any organization, it is about your relationship with your board your relationship with your staff, your members, your customers, your stakeholders, your competition, uh, your industry, whatever it happens to be. And I would make a strong argument that, you know, back to that question around duplication of efforts and why are there so many alphabet soup things doing the same thing? And I would say at this point, let's even just take uh, the, the um, 
the work you're doing, Victoria. I would say at this point, I want more leaders and people at the table helping to solve this problem than less. So you know what, more organizations, more, but with that in mind, how do we come together as a coalition to, to work the, the, the solution, work the, the challenge? So again, I would go back to, you know, I, I think one of the themes I hear coming out of this is, um, if Victoria, you had like this, this platform where 30 nonprofits got together once a month or once a quarter, and you all started to know one another, and they really got to know you and hear your mission and blah, blah, blah. Not that you didn't know any of these people you reached out to, because I'm sure you did, but it would be, it, you know, it's like, it's like relationship. It's like, got to start the engine first and get it warmed up. And then you're, you know, and if we kind of kept meeting and coming together, you'd be able to go to those people fa faster and better. I, you know, I think of our work with John Burnham at the NBA, and there's not a week that I'm not talking to John. And that's different than our original relationship with the NBA, to be honest. Um, you know, start, go, start, go, open a welcome center, close a welcome center. Um, but having John there and being able to work with him on a golf tournament and on the Valentine's Day sweets crawl and other things, um, you know, it's just, again, relationships and communication. So again, I would, I would, I would uh, em employ to this group, you know, whether it's the deletion of duplication of efforts, which I don't think is going to happen because everybody does have an ego and everybody has to protect their own organization. So there's no way they're going to dissolve. Um, perhaps, and I think you guys have already kind of poked at it, this kind of coalition of the people coming together. Um, and does that, does that strengthen the, the, even the, like you said, Victoria, the, the giving of money, look, I got 15,000 bucks, you know, here you go. Um, but food for thought. Um, we have, you know, again, we could go forever, which as we said, Victoria and I could, um, but I think, you know, we're, we're at a good place. We've got about 10 minutes left to one. So why don't we try and end around one o'clock, but was there anything else uh, from a nonprofit industry or the chamber of commerce? And you don't have to, you know, don't have to talk about the chamber of commerce, but that's, we're on the call. So you, you're more than welcome to give us some feedback too, but just something in general in Vermont or in your industry or in your communities you want to talk about. That's it, huh? Well, Matt, how do we how do we get in touch with other people on this meeting? I'll send an email out to all of you that will have the contact information for everyone that was on the call, and actually for the people who signed up that didn't make it for whatever reason. I'll also share that with you. Um, but before we go, I just wanted to commend each of you. We all know that working for a nonprofit is very difficult. Um, and most of us do it because we have a passion for it. And it's obvious all of you on the call have a passion for the work that you are doing. And I do hope that going forward, there were some things that each, um, person brought or said that another individual on the call is like, I'm going to reach out to that person and, you know, let's discuss this a little further. And if somebody does want to head up that um, once a month coffee club, happy to join in if you want us to, happy to, you know, step back or what, whatever you need from us. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we're here. And I just wanted to let you know that I, can, I think it's amazing the work that all of you are doing and I appreciate you taking the time to join us on this call. And please, 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 I know I don't have to tell Gloria, <laughs> but um, we do have a community calendar. So any event that your organization is doing, please put up on that calendar. Um, we get thousands of visitors to the Bennington.com website, which is where it sits, but we also, um, Matt puts together this great Friday e-blast 80%, 90% of the content of upcoming events that is shared with not only other members, but visitors. Um, we pull that information from that calendar. So if you have something coming up and you want people to know about it, please use it. If you, you don't know how to get to that calendar, email me, uh, I'll send you the link or I'll send you a quick video on how to put things up there. So Laura, I appreciate all of the work that you do in keeping that current and keeping so many things going up there. 
Thank I you. think she has like some child slave somewhere. Just <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, no, it's I mean, not, not a child, not a child though, but I do have an assistant who is yeah. on top of it. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's great. Um, I, I do want to mention, and I know, um, I know uh, Natalie had to hop off, but um, there are in-person things coming back. So as much as we love hopping on these digital calls and we really are in a hybrid way saying, look, this is great. We've got Northshire, we've got Southshire. This is exactly what we want to do. And I don't think anybody would, maybe they would, but I don't think we'd all hop in a car and zoom back and forth uh, for a round table. So things like this and lunch and learns are a great opportunity to hop on a digital call and meet people. That being said, especially with the summer months coming, uh, we know, we know getting together in person when we can in a safe manner is extremely important both to this chamber, to its membership, to all of you. So tomorrow night, we will be at the uh, Southern Vermont Art Center for uh, I think our, uh, it's not our first mixer because we did one at the Park McCullough, right? Right, our second mixer. Um, so this will be our first second one, but first one in the North Shire. So uh, please come on up around 5.30. Uh, tomorrow and uh, Ann Corso and her team will be on display with the Curate uh, Cafe. Uh, and so we'll be meeting in that uh, place. We also have, um, I had mentioned um, the, the Women in Leadership Luncheon, which is sold out, but hopefully some of you got tickets. So we'll be able to see you then. Uh, and just to kind of keep an FYI, just so you all know, we're sharing this with our members. Um, when we're, we're testing out this kind of challenges and solutions forum, um, we're going to do a housing challenges and solutions forum with housing experts and industry uh, practitioners. So it's not that the whole membership has to come to it, but as we hear these problems arise and workforce is probably going to be the second one. Um, but the first one was housing. So we're having everything from carpenters to banks to attorneys to realtors to investors, um, you know, all of them Employers. kind of trying to get the Yeah get them to uh in a room and say we recognize the challenge let's again use what what we deem as the best way for which is collaboration and coalition building to figure out how to how to, how to improve this so housing is going to be next week um and then i would assume sometime in the summer we will put together uh, workforce one. So again, from a nonprofit perspective, you may want to join that one and say, yeah, we're, we're hurting or we have unique ways as a nonprofit that for-profit people may not know. And we want to share some of those tactics because uh, we can get creative with, we can get creative with our staffing. Uh, Victoria, you had a hand. Can up. I share the information now about the housing one? I'm just thinking I'm on the Manchester housing committee i don't know if that's yeah. the official work name. with erica if it's a housing committee so what i don't want to do is invite all 400 members um we do have kind of limited we're doing it at the country mount uh, mount anthony country club next week but if you have a specific housing committee or whatever please work with erica and we'll get the we'll send you the right information victoria and you can get yeah it i was just gonna send it to like janet hurley or john o'keefe yeah yeah that'd be great i know john that. John already got an email, but Janet would be good too. But why don't go offline and work with Erica? And because we have kind of this master list of like, I think at this point it's 80 that we say these are key people that are investing in housing, whether that be a bank, a carpenter, you know, all of Bill Drunzik, uh, you know. Uh, so we have those names, but we're always adding to it. And we really want to kind of have this master list of like, impactful housing influencers. And we want to do the same for workforce as well. So Did, right. can I just ask a quick closing yeah. question? How many nonprofits either on this call or that you know of in Bennington County have um, our AmeriCorps, VIS, AmeriCorps sites? Um, I don't, what's that? <laughs> I think I know of two, Parent, Lake Parent, right? Maybe. Yeah, in years past, we've had four to six, and I know the hospital has been the one in the past that has led that charge. And I believe Kaya Morris was the one that originally started the program, but Jim Tremarkey uh, and maybe BCRC, Bennington County Regional Commission, have taken that on. Um, but why? Well, I mean, Great program. I just wondered, we've, we've been a long time AmeriCorps site, and this is the first year due pretty much due to COVID that we 
were not an AmeriCorps site because okay. there was no housing. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, that's good. That's good for us to know for next week. But I, so who did you normally go? Like, how did you, did you fill out an AmeriCorps application or do you have to go, do you have like a navigator locally that you always go through? Um, I've always that's thought like it was Mar kind of That's like a Marianne question because yeah. I, I wasn't involved in the AmeriCorps program, but um, it was done out of Montpelier were okay. our contacts. Okay. We um, usually let, me, too. let me check in um, with Jim and I just want to get kind of an idea from him if he's still running the program. Yeah, I, know I can't. From I, yeah, I can't remember if the hospital still. Rory yeah. Price, I thought, was their last AmeriCorps and she now works for the Office of Local Health. Yeah, I mean, Rory was one of the first years. I mean, now they have Madison Creamer, who's over at Shire's Housing, and she was maybe two years. Michelle Morocco. Uh, so, I mean, it's a program that has really brought it's some a, really for dynamic. For nonprofits, it does a lot. The, the AmeriCorps program is a really great resource. Well, and, and, then, and then they fall in love with the region. And, you know, even if we keep 25% of them each year, which we tend to do, um, you know, you look at our, our nonprofits or healthcare industry. I mean, we at least keep one AmeriCorps here for a solid couple of years, which is just fantastic. So. Some of our AmeriCorps have become staff members. Yep. Yep. I believe it. And Rory was up at the hospital before that. So uh, she had worked, worked there too. Okay. Well, everybody, we're at one o'clock and I want to be mindful of your time. I know we're all uh, busy. We've got a lot of great nonprofits to run and the sun is out and it may get over 50 today. So make sure you take care of yourself, get outside, go for a walk or something. And I uh, really appreciate you hopping on. We're going to have a recording of this probably by end of day. It'll be in the e-blast on Friday. Um, so you can always go back if you missed anything. Erica will send out the full attendance list of people that mm -hmm. registered. Um, and, and Erica and I will go offline a little bit. I want to I want to uh, tackle our challenge a little bit of figuring out how we could do this more often for all of you. I think you're a I think you're a unique group. Like I wouldn't get a I wouldn't get a coffee together for all our financial institutions. But I, I think there's something there because you are also diverse in your mission. Yet you all can relate in your industry as nonprofits. Uh, and we know that nonprofits in Vermont are are very you know populated and run a lot of our community. Um, so yeah, let's, I'll, I'll, Eric and I will connect about that and, and go from there. But thank you everybody. And I uh, really appreciate everybody hopping on and have a great rest of the day. Bye everyone. Thank you.